I want to thank you all for taking time tonight to come out and hear our side of the story about spraying, jobs, and forestry management in New Brunswick. I could have written a book about all there is that needs to be said about this, but I worked pretty hard to keep this presentation as short as possible while still being able to give you a good idea about what we're dealing with. Now, it should take me about 25 minutes to get through this presentation, so I won't keep you too long. Thanks to Mary de Lavalette for having us up here, and thanks, as always, to Rob Cumberland for sharing his expertise. Now I'm going to start off with a brief introduction about myself and then get into the presentation. My name is Peter Gilbert. I'm married with two children. We live in Smithfield, New Brunswick, which is just down this side of Harvey. Last fall, I got uptight when the province fired the chief medical officer of health. And that led to the first time that I ever even heard of glyphosate and how it was being used in our province. I became more concerned with how our government was being run and by who. I then decided to devote 10 percent of my free time to getting involved with this issue. And that story starts with the control of government by industry and the self-serving approach of that industry. So let's get into the presentation, where in the heck? There we go. So now for tonight. I'm here on behalf of Stop Spraying New Brunswick, where I'm one of the many organizers. We have some free materials you can take with you, as well as some t-shirts and signs bumper stickers uh, that are also for sale. Now, 100% of the sale of these items goes towards uh, funding Stop Spraying New Brunswick activities. It doesn't take us much money to do what we want to do, but a little bit uh, helps a lot. <coughs> so Stop Spraying New Brunswick was formed to put an end to the spraying of herbicides on Crown lands. And since then, we've broadened our mandate a bit to speak to the spraying of herbicides on crown, industrial, and freehold private forest operations. Tonight, Mary de Lavalette asked me to come up here and talk about jobs and how spraying relates to jobs. I then found out Rob Cumberland was speaking as well, and I wondered about what I was going to talk about. I've seen several of Rod's presentations now and I know I wouldn't be able to improve on anything that he had to say. So I thought I'd talk about when we didn't use herbicides, why we use herbicides now, where we're going if we don't stop using herbicides, and a sensible solution, sustainable forestry management. Now this presentation would only take one minute by saying if you want to stop spraying and increase jobs, the people of New Brunswick have to step up and defend their rights to the land which is theirs. We need to see a forest management policy that respects the natural diversity of our Acadian forest. We're paying right now to deprive our communities and land of its natural heritage. We need to see the unequivocal maintenance of a healthy environment. And tonight, I want to add to that and give you some context about what's happened to forestry management in the last 43 years in New Brunswick. This will serve to highlight the difficulties we face when we look at jobs and the diminishing health and diversity of our natural resources. Now I want to leave you with a sense of what we need to do to win the next round in the fight for the natural resources that belong to the people of New Brunswick. Without them, rural New Brunswick will continue to fade. Oh. <laughs> so where are we now? 
without even explaining this chart, I'm sure that all of you could tell me where you think New Brunswick is on this chart. We're at the bottom. This chart's from a paper titled Forestry Jobs and Forestry Management in the Maritimes in Northeastern USA. It shows the employment intensity in New Brunswick as compared to, compared to other regions in the Northeast. In purple, we see the employment for 1,000 cubic meters of timber harvested in other nearby regions. And in red, we see a projection for New Brunswick's employment for the forest strategy that we're now engaged in. And we see New Brunswick's employment intensity down here at the bottom, and I want you to make note of Quebec's job ratio up here, as I'll be borrowing heavily from Quebec's sustainable forest management strategy in order to talk about how we should be moving forward. So what happened? Jean-Guy Camo from Miramichi pointed out that in the 1980 Crown Land and Forest Act, a section of the Act specified that the mandate was to encourage the management of private forest land to be the primary source of timber for wood processing plants in the province. Crown lands were meant to serve as residual supply. So how do we go from that mandate in 1980 to what we got now? We all know the answer to that, and here's a summary. Let's go from 1980 to 2001, when the NB Forest Products Association raised concerns to the Department of Natural Resources. The Forest Products Association asked for the revision of the Crown Lands Forest Management Agreement to double the softwood annual allowable cut, to revise policies whereby government is held financially responsible if the objectives of the Forest Agreement are not met, and to implement a silviculture program to achieve the objectives of doubling the annual allowable cut. From there, DNR paid the multinational consulting firm Yako Pori Management $150,000 to produce a report as to how New Brunswick could achieve, achieve these objectives. <coughs> now Jean-Guy Camo points out what that report was not concerned with. It doesn't, however, consider the New Brunswick system if it's to the advantage of New Brunswickers. Nor does it consider the needs of rural communities where historically many families have relied on work in the forest for their survival. So 20 years after private woodlot owners had significant control over establishing their own timber prices, their power was arrested. Now this is a chart from the DNR staff review of the Yako Pori report. And here's what we're looking at for Crown Lands under an intensive management scenario. This chart shows the proposed transition from Acadian forest to plantations. Down here we've got 2007. This shows the composition of the New Brunswick forests. Uh, and it, into the future, where obviously you can see here, there's a fairly large increase in plantations in the order of 50% of the managed woods. That's, where the, that's what they want to see under this intensive management scenario. So if we want to talk about jobs, we've got to talk about the forest management strategy. Spraying's an essential tool in the forest management strategy. Right now, 85 to 90% of industrial forestry in New Brunswick is based on clear cuts and by the look of things they're not going back to private woodlot owners establishing their own timber prices <coughs> and things are looking up for spraying operations. In the immediate future things are looking very grave for the Acadian forest and everything that depends on it for survival. Now we don't have to guess about what the plan is. In this chart, yellow represents managed wood volumes that are coming from plantations under the proposed intensive management scenario that we're now engaged in. This is from a PowerPoint presentation 
by J.D. Irving. The presentation was found as a written document in the possession of David Allward at the New Brunswick Media Archives by the NB Media Co-op and the Halifax Media Co-op. It's unknown who else in government saw this presentation. But again, it's quite similar to the last slide that we saw. We're in right here, we're, we're, we're around 2007. And this is where, take, where they're taking the available wood volume from plantations into the future. And again, in the order of 50% of the managed wood volume. This is their plan. <coughs> now, <coughs> excuse me. The only good thing I see about this is we're not going to run out of toilet paper anytime soon, but one half of the province's wood volume will transition from the Acadian forest to planting a monoculture. This is another chart from that same presentation that JDI delivered to who knows who in senior government. It was in the possession of David Allward. But again, it says a lot. We don't have to guess about what their plan is. Yellow, or where am I here now? What is happening? <coughs> oh yeah, sorry. Before we get into this one, I want to explain what freehold refers to. Freehold lands are lands that are owned privately by commercial forest operations, as I'm going to be referring to it here shortly. Now, with that understanding, not only does industry promote one half of the province's wood volume coming from plantations, but this presentation to government also shows projective savings if Crown land is managed the same as JDI freehold interests. They say this is achievable by the year 2050. Down here, that's what they're doing, and that's where we're going. Through presentations to our senior government officials, Industry applies undue pressure to push their pill. The voice of the people's not heard. The voice of the wildlife's not heard. And this is how corporate control takes place. And finally, for the charts, what we see here from the 2014 forest management strategy is a drastic change in our forest condition. The composition of our forest is largely unchanged except in two key areas. Plantations and old growth forest. Where are they getting the new area for plantations? Old growth forest. This is going on right now. I know it's going on right now uh, all around me. I see it every day when I drive the roads. And it's going on right now around you. I know you see the same thing I do. It's quite a bit different than it was a few years ago. They're hitting her hard. And we can see exactly where they're going in the future with it. Looks something like that. So we know where we're at. We know where we're going. There's minimal consideration in this deal for us. And things aren't looking good for spraying. And things aren't looking very good for the Acadian forest. And things are looking terrible for wildlife, as Rod exhibited. This is what the people of New Brunswick are getting out of their crown lands that's intended to be used for the people of New Brunswick and future generations. Now, we'll ease up a little bit. After that depressing dose of reality, let's have a look at a healthy forest management strategy that respects the environment and all of its stakeholders. We have to see diversity. We have to see diversity for a healthy forest ecosystem and diversity in a wide range of forest products. This is the least that we can do to ensure a healthy human population and a strong and resilient forest-based economy. We obviously have to see economic viability in our forest management plan. And we have to see the maintenance of a good quality environment. And this is particularly important at this point in time in human history, as we consider our children's future. 
we have to see the social acceptability of forest practices. Now for a healthy economy and community, we need to involve all of our stakeholders. This includes the people in New Brunswick, villages, towns, cities, and industry. And we have to see the equitable sharing of benefits. Crown lands are for the people in New Brunswick and future generations. The current forest management plan respects only one of these five pillars of sustainable forest management. If we want to see a fair and equitable system that respects the interests of all of the forest stakeholders, we need to change the primary objectives of the forest strategy, and only then will we stand a chance of getting what we want. The stranglehold on government by industry must end. We need to take back what was once ours. So let's have a closer look at what we want. Diversity, when we talk about diversity and sustainable forest management, we're looking at diversity in the forest uh, uh, ecosystem as well as e uh, economic diversity. The current New Brunswick forest management strategy does not concern itself with diversity in either of those fields. We're largely at the bottom of the value added chain with the current vision. In order to remain competitive at the bottom, they have to employ production techniques to survive at the bottom. So they spray and they keep labor costs down. Let's demand diversity in our forest ecosystem, our forest economy, and respect for our crown lands that are intended to be used for the people of New Brunswick and future generations. Now, economic viability, this one's self-explanatory. And the maintenance of a good quality environment. Again, it should be abundantly clear at this point in human history that we cannot tolerate environmental practices that are questionable or unsafe. We're not in a position to gamble on this anymore. And there's only one way if we're to conduct ourselves responsibly with future generations in mind. Now, of all the information that I've collected in my time with Stop Spraying New Brunswick, I had to pull this one out there because there's been none that has more impact on me than this. It really hits home. With the herbicides, they do kill the invertebrates and some of the fungus that the voles and mice eat, which of course then flows through the food chain and you lose the ecosystem with the wildlife. Now we don't have to think very hard about what this means because we're seeing it right now. We're seeing the very early effects of the New Brunswick Forest Management Strategy on our wildlife, on our people, and on our communities. Rod and many others have done more than enough to call into question claims of science that's put forward by the proponents and beneficiaries of that science. And they call us questionable. And you tell me, who's speaking for personal gain and who's speaking with common sense and reason? We can't gamble anymore on industry-sponsored science. We require nothing but a safe and healthy environment and there are no reasonable risks. Look at what we've done now, and look at where we're going. I was told by a current Crown Land silviculture forester that everything is subject to concern and criticism. If they waited for consensus, they'd never get anything done. And I say there is a way, and it has to respect the maintenance of a good quality environment. Now, social acceptability of forest practices. Our population and communities have very significant needs with respect to forest management. We have to respect those needs if we're to maintain a healthy and diverse culture that represents New Brunswick. Our rural communities have always relied heavily on our natural resources for subsistence. So where are we now? I don't have to present any statistics or charts to exhibit the drastic transformation that's occurred in our rural communities as a result in the New Brunswick current forest practices. 
Now, equitable sharing of benefits. We have spread the proceeds around a little bit better. Right now, industries managing our forests make as much money as they can for themselves, first and foremost, and that's the bottom line. This is how you do it if you want to make as much money as possible and compete against others who are doing it the same way. They have well-crafted industry-sponsored science and public relations to present their numbers or come up, come up with their own numbers if need be. They're doing it a lot different in Quebec and Vermont and many other regions where spraying is not used as a tool in forestry management. They respect the five pillars of sustainable forest management. <clears throat> now, lumberjack Leo Gauguin from Rogersville said it best when he turned to the DNR minister, Denny Landry, at the May 18th Stop Spraying New Brunswick uh, petition submission. Leo pointed out that it's unreal the trouble that our private woodlot owners have making a living because of the destruction of Crown lands. I urge you all to check out the video that's referenced here. Leo's pointing at DNR Minister Denny Landry, telling him exactly what we all want him to hear. <clears throat> so remember where industry's forest management plan has gotten us. All we can do is ask questions about why we're at the bottom. Could it have something to do with the current forest management strategy? That'd be a good guess. Now, who is primarily responsible for the composition and implementation of the current forest management strategy? Who's the third largest landowner in the United States and the largest private landowner in Maine and runs northern Maine much the same as they do here in New Brunswick? I'll conclude part one of my presentation by leaving you with a couple questions. How do we get more jobs out of our forest resources? That answer should be obvious. We can look next door. We can look into a couple other areas not too far away where they're not spraying, and we can get all those answers. I say let's have a look at some healthy and diverse management options before they lay waste to all that was once beautiful in New Brunswick. I suggest we demand change that respects the five pillars of sustainable forest management. These principles are being practiced right next door to us here in Quebec. They've been doing it this way for 15 years, and I urge you all to read through Quebec's sustainable forest management strategy, which is referenced at the end of this presentation, because it contains all the answers that you want to see. So what can you do? Contact the Minister of Energy and Resource Development, Rick Doucette, and demand that he lives up to his obligations as prescribed by the Canadian Council of Forest Ministers, which states, jurisdictions require that all, forested, all forests harvested on public lands must be successfully regen regenerated and reflect their natural diversity. Let him know that we, the people, demand this, and no less. Contact your PCMLA, Jake Stewart. I've heard that he'll be especially interested to hear from you on this. Now, I'm going to leave you with a couple of stories. <laughs> no? <laughs> Don't like that one, Pam? No, he's not going to listen to you. Are you serious? We won't get into that right now. Okay. You can. <laughs> so I'm, okay. I'm going to leave you with a couple of stories, other stories that you might like on how to affect change. The first is in reference to the Stop Spraying New Brunswick petition. On May 18th, we presented over 13,000 petition uh, signatures to uh, two MLAs at the Provincial Legislature in Fredericton. Join us at our next petition submission and let your voice be heard. Fill our mailbox with signed petitions so that we can continue to go and speak out on your behalf as we want to take back what was once all of ours. Now, we're looking for 40,000 total signatures so we can hit 5% of the New Brunswick population, at which point we'll go to government and we'll be looking for an independent public consultation on spraying. This is the path they took in Quebec. This is how they do it. And we need to get all of you on board behind us so we can do what we want to do and see this through. 
Now, 40,000 might seem like a big number. So let me tell you the story of Francine Levesque. Francine is from Kedgwick, a small community much the same as Doketown, where in most of the surrounding area is heavily reliant on natural resources for its heritage and its livelihood. Now, Francine was personally responsible for 4,000 of the 13,000 signatures that we submitted in May. That's one person. If we had 10 more Francines, we'd be there. And that's good, but most of them happen one at a time. That's why we'd really appreciate anyone who can take anything they can do and get out there and get us some more signatures so we can go in for another worthy petition submission. <coughs> Now we're going back to the legislature as soon as we've got enough uh, signatures to make it worth uh, doing so. And we're looking for your help to get us a few more signatures to make another worthy petition submission. This will get us enough to ask for an independent consultation. Now in closing, I want to thank you all again for coming out in support of a more balanced approach to management of our natural resources. For access to any of the information that was presented here tonight, please get in touch with Mary. And finally, I wanted to say, this is very grave. It's our future and it's our children's future that depends on us to act right now. We don't have time to wait on these things any longer. We've wait, waited long enough, and you see what we got. I don't got a lot of time to deal with these things, but any little bit of spare time I do have outside of my garden and my wife and my children and my job and whatever else, same as you, I, 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 I do everything I can to uh, uh, speak to the problems that, that I see. They might seem insurmountable, but we've, you know, we've got to do it. We don't have any choice, and it's our children that depend on this more than us. We're going to be all right. So if you want to see things as you once had it, follow Leo's lead and do what you can. It's up to us to step up and make it happen. All we can do is play our part fit in as opportunities arise, and fight for what was once ours. It's up to each of us to figure out how we can fit in and do it. Um, we've we've got to take this one back. It's ours. Thank you. <laughs>